part of the campaign by the CIA against Nicaragua is, in, is through paramilitary units and squads of Soma's former Somacista soldiers who are being trained in Honduras. And their campaign is against these Mosquito Indians. And a lot of hundreds of Mosquitoes have been killed by those squads in cross-border raids. Now, the circumstances of this killing are pure terrorism recruiting terrorists to go across the port border and blow up and assassinate and kill. We have to remember that the next time President Reagan or Alexander uh, the Hague uh, are making their pious statements about the threat of international terrorism and the horrors of international terrorism, the United States is, without any serious competition, leading the world in international terrorism today and for the past 30 years the last in our three-part series on what the intelligence services are doing. With John Stockwell, former CIA official, and editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin, Lewis Wolf, tonight on Alternative Views. This is our last program in the series on what the government and private intelligence organizations are doing around the world. This is Lewis Wolf, co-editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin, which specializes in revealing what these organizations are doing. Our other guest is John Stockwell, who was with the CIA for many years, had a high position in the organization, actually ran their Angolan operation, and quit, wrote the book, in Search of Enemies, subsequently a new novel, Red Sunset. Tonight we'll discuss particularly the CIA in Latin America and the total ramification on how this fits in to the United States foreign policy and the ramifications overseas. Now let's have some news. Everybody knows there's unemployment, but the cost to the American people, to individuals, as well as the economy and the social fabric of the nation is staggering. For instance, each 1% increment of unemployment diminishes the gross national product by about 68 billion. These are 1980 estimates. A lot of studies now are being made by sociologists and economists of the impact of, of uh, unemployment, and this is just one of the statistics. The direct cost to the federal government and lost tax revenue and increased expenditures for each 1% rise in unemployment is over $25 billion. And of course, when the deficit goes up, so do the interest rates, and that puts an additional burden on the economy. But these statistics on unemployment actually underestimate the problem because you have to add to the unemployment, which we have right now, the almost 10%. The 5.8 million involuntary part-time workers, or at, they're at a record high too, 1.2 million. And also add the record number of discouraged workers, 10.8 million. So you actually get a grand total of unemployed or partly employed, 17.8 million or 16.2%. Now, if you also compare this with the Great Depression and to count in the factor of the millions of people who are in the armed forces are working for the government in relationship to defense, take them out of it and put them on the unemployed rolls like they were back in 1929, we actually would have an unemployment rate, a rate much more severe than of the Great Depression. It even gets worse when you talk about individuals. They've found now that each percentage point of increase of unemployment sustained over five years provides a 4.1 increase in suicides, 4.3% increase among men, 2.3 among women, in first-time admissions to state mental hospitals, 1.9% increase in deaths from disease, an increase of 4% in prison admissions, 5.7% increase in homicides. And of course, kids who don't get jobs during the summer are more likely to turn to crime to make ends meet. 
So everything isn't just the cold hard. Well, today, friends, the unemployment rate rose up almost to 10 percent. People are hurting. Some people are not, though. Some people are not. In fact, while a lot of people are hurting for the unemployment and the poor are getting poorer under Reaganomics, the rich are getting richer. Forbes magazine advertises itself on television as a capitalist tool that will help young executives get the skills and the information they need to help them in their climb up the corporate ladder. And every year they they publish the salaries of the highest 20 corporate executives. And the winner this year, folks, was the president of Warner's Communication, who came in for a cool $27.5 million a year. They also listed the next person, who was $7.5 million a year, also a corporate executive of a communications empire, and then listed the next 20 corporate executives, all of whom made over a million dollars a year. Missing for the first time from the top 20 were corporation executives from the automobile, the steel, or the manufacturing industries, which evidently aren't doing so well under today's economy. In fact, Craig, you have some information that small business, like the poor and the unemployed, are suffering in the age of Reaganomics. Right, and not so small necessarily. I like to call this little bit of commentary, still we got fun. <laughs> yes, folks, it's time once again to ask, How's business? Not so good, to put it in a nutshell. But if you've been following the annex of the Reagan team, you know it's not their fault. When inflation dips below the double-digit level, it's because Reaganomics is taking hold. But when leading economic indicators continue to shrivel and die on the vine, then of course, it's the business blight brought on by that old peanut farmer, Jimmy Carter, lingering on. You might say that politicians in general can display an amazing flexibility in some matters, particularly when relating to interim elections. Well, the lingering effects of peanut policy this time has led to a virtual epidemic of bankruptcies. The Wall Street Journal reports a post-depression high in the percentage of failing firms. For the first three months of this year, an average of 36 businesses per hour have gone belly up an increase from last year of 29 percent. At that pace, nearly 75,000 companies will go bankrupt this year, a new American record. Now these aren't just your family-run shoestring organizations either. Braniff Airlines, for one, went down in flames recently, and indications are that International Harvester may soon join the scrap heap. With revenues last year of over seven billion dollars, International Harvester would be the largest U.S. company ever to file bankruptcy. At least for the time being, that is. Edward Altman, the chairman of the MBA program at New York University, estimates that 200 of the biggest 2,000 industrial concerns now teeter on the brink of collapse. Well, inevitably, the big losers when a company folds are the workers. Four out of five bankruptcy filings are for straight liquidation as in, that's all she wrote. In the trucking industry, for example, 144 companies have gone under since mid-1980 at the cost of over 28,000 jobs. But that's not the worst of it. Consider the plight of hundreds of West Virginia coal miners who were stuck with unpaid medical bills when their employers went bankrupt without having paid the insurance premiums. What a nice surprise. The big winners in bankruptcy, naturally, are lawyers, accountants, and bankers. That's when the loot's all divvied up. Particularly since the 1979 revision of the bankruptcy code eliminated the requirement that, quote, a spirit of economy prevail when bankruptcy lawyers set their fees. As might be expected, the hogs are hunkering down to the old trough. In Miami, for instance, a lawyer in a bankruptcy proceeding for the GAC Corporation sought court approval for a fee, and you're gonna love this, for $210 an hour for 7,000 hours of work, or a cool $1.5 million for a half a year's job. The judge settled a paltry $650,000 on him. You know, friends, maybe we're all in the wrong line of work. And with all this talk of bankruptcy and depression, I thought I was making the shrewd move, socking my money into apples and pencils. 
<laughs> well, I have a story here on the tragedy of dolphins around the world, particularly in Japan. This was provided by the Greenpeace people. Well, in the spring of 1980, Japanese fishermen began slaughtering dolphins off of Iki Island. They thought then that the dolphins were stealing their catch, refusing to acknowledge the fact that overfishing and heavy coastal pollution by man really bore much of the blame, the real blame. Dolphins, just by the hundreds, lie dead along the beaches of Iki Island in, by Japan, just waiting to be processed into fertilizer. The Japanese fishermen plan to continue this slaughter, and they will unless worldwide pressure is put on them. And this is the, what the Greenpeace people are trying to do. Worldwide, thousands of dolphins are being killed every year by Americans, Japanese, Turks, Peruvians. Man's war against the dolphins doesn't have any boundaries at all. In the United States alone, the government allows the killing of 31,000 dolphins a year by American tuna boats. So how do these um, wonderful, amazing, fun-loving, gentle animals end? Ground into fertilizer, the consequence of man's unthinking and unfeeling relation to the earth and his fellow creatures. Let's focus on one of the current and most spectacular revelations that the CIA has made in recent years, and that is their expose of Nicaragua that was just yesterday, the day before we're taping this, where a Department of Defense personnel and a CIA director, Bobby Inman, yes. I think it was, claimed to have photographs that showed that Nicaragua was greatly increasing their military forces, that it was on the same model as Cuba's, that this was all being funded by the Soviet Union, that Nicaragua was systematically carrying out genocidal operations against Indian tribes living in Nicaragua. They had pictures of villages that had been uh, destroyed. What would your attitude towards this be? I think the first time that I can remember since the Bay of Pigs that a single, uh, there may have been one other case, but it's, it's almost the only case since then that the CIA uh, or U.S. intelligence has disclosed satellite data with, from which they say this came. Uh, now, satellite data, by its very nature, and depending on how far they enlarge it, uh, can be made to prove anything. Uh, these pictures, I'm not saying, I do not know, I have not seen the pictures, but. Uh, we are asked to believe that these picture, pictures were taken within the last several months uh, in Nicaragua or over Nicaragua by U.S. satellites. We are further asked to believe that uh, the, the uh, activity which is portrayed in these pictures uh, is taking place as of now. Uh, recently, uh, Secretary Haig said, and he held it up as, as, as the smoking gun in a press conference, that uh, his information was that the Nicaraguan government was engaged in uh, massive repression against the Mosquito Indians. Right. That was the big and point they made again yesterday with these pictures of burned out villages. Well, uh, one of those, the picture to which Secretary Haig referred to mm -hmm. in his press conference uh, 10 days ago uh, was a picture which was published in Le Figaro magazine in, in Paris. And uh, it later turned out that that picture had been published with a caption saying that this was the, Nicarag the present Nicaraguan government uh, showing them burning houses and burning people alive, I believe. Uh, it turned out that that picture, and Le Figaro has admitted it since then, mm -hmm. uh, was a picture that was taken uh, during the Somoza rule and that the, those pictures uh, were five, four or five years old. Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Haig has had to, uh, or General Haig has had to uh, pull back on that one, but they are now still saying that there is massive repression against the Mosquito Indians. I would simply point out that uh, uh, it's a dichotomy and a, a contradiction for this government to uh, give a great deal of attention to the human rights of mosquitoes if, in fact, these abuses are taking place uh, when, in fact, uh, Native Americans are not accorded the same attention by our government. 
nor are the El Salvadorian right. people who are systematically being killed by these death squads. That are and the Guatemalan Indians are, are being almost annihilated. It's almost a genocidal campaign by the Guatemalan government against the Indians in Guatemala. Uh, I do hope that uh, some of this, well, first of all, there is a, a lot of evidence coming out that the uh, part of the campaign by the CIA against Nicaragua is, in, is through paramilitary units and squads of Somos, former Somosista soldiers who are being trained in Honduras. And their campaign is against these Mosquito Indians. And a lot of hundreds of Mosquitoes have been killed by those squads in cross-border raids. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why uh, that the Nicaraguan government has been forced, I believe, by these campaigns to, to move uh, a lot of these people away from the areas where they're in danger is because of those activities, not because of a policy of the Nicaraguan right. government. It's as a result what of the What would their reason the be to have genocide against these tribes, the current government in Nicaragua? The State Department hasn't given any hypotheses about why they would be engaging in this. I can't see any motive for it. Yeah, it seems strange. Well, they, they pretend and would have us believe that the Nicaraguan government is, uh, is a totalitarian, one-party, uh, top-down, dictatorial rule, and that they have no uh, wish to integrate the Mosquito Indians into, into, their, into, a society, into their society, and that furthermore they uh, have us believe that the Mosquitoes want to secede or mm -hmm. want to have an independent uh, country or state or at least an area which they can call a separate country. I don't think there's any evidence to show that that's uh, what the Mosquito Indians wish. John, since the time we did that interview with Lewis Wolf, there's been quite a few revelations about CIA covert operations in Nicaragua. Can you comment on those? I think there were some stories in, in these times about some of the things that the CIA was up to there. I can comment in a speculative way since I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm an analyzing the news now based on my past experience, of course. But uh, let's see, what's the inflation rate since uh, 1975 to 1982? In America? Yeah. What it's would that amount probably, to? Five years? It's, it's uh, been about 10% a year. But almost. Even more. The, the point is that the CIA's budget, it's been announced that the, the CIA, the president signed an order on the 1st of December ordering the CIA into full paramilitary covert action against Nicaragua from Honduras, organizing mercenaries to destabilize the countryside, to counter the Cuban aggression in that country, is uh, what, what they announced was the justification. And um, the budget they were given was 19 million. I compare that with the 14 million that I was given in 1975 in Angola in Ang for the Angolan operation. The parallels are quite striking. You know, there were parallels with the Angolan operation in the Bay of Pigs, uh, for example, and other covert actions. But then Guatemala was different, and Iran was different. So you know, each one, each situation is different. But here, we have so, it's so close. They're working from Honduras. We were working from Zaire and Kinshasa. Uh, they're working with uh, ex-Samosist. Uh, we were working with the Portuguese exiles, the Portuguese who had fled, for example, creating an army out of these people. Also, they have, uh, quote, mercenaries, uh, but actually soldiers, who were sent from uh, Argentina, for example, and uh, Venezuela and Chile and Colombia. Uh, to to join this force, we had people coming from various places, from France, for example, and of course the South African force. They're functioning. Uh, the, 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 I could I could map out the the office for you, the program, the international program. Some things that I would observe if you've read my book is that such an operation is global. The commander would not be sitting in Honduras running the thing. The commander of the Nicaraguan task force will be in Washington. He will be sending agents uh, all around the world coordinating different aspects of this thing. They'll be sending cables to every station in the world advising the chief of station what his activities should be vis-a-vis -vis the local police and the local president and the local press to create an atmosphere supporting to the greatest extent possible what they're doing seeking arms that aren't attributable, seeking sources of 
news comments and releases that can be uh, put together in white papers to, to persuade. And then the bottom line that the justification Reagan has given and the CIA have given for doing this intervention is to counter the Cuban activities in Nicaragua. But see, the point is that there are not going to be any Cubans die in this thing. There, I believe there, it said that there are 2,000 Cubans in Nicaragua now. They're functioning to help build an airport and no doubt military uh, advising, although I've, I've not seen that confirmed anywhere. A lot of doctors, medical personnel. Uh, uh, doctors and medical personnel and teachers and whatnot. And uh, from Italy and several other countries as well. It's not just Cubans that oh, have indeed. Oh, indeed. to uh, Nicaragua, but a variety of countries. The Nicaraguan sent. arms, it's been shown, are not coming from the Soviet Union. They're buying them from France and Italy right. and, and all kinds of other places. Or are they coming from, from, uh, from Cuba? This has been proven. By it. But uh, the point is that this program of the CIA is not going to be killing Cubans. Uh, it's going to be killing Nicaraguans. It's not going to be killing Nicaraguan officials, not that many Nicaraguan soldiers. It's going to be destabilizing the countryside, blowing up bridges, ambushing bush buses. Uh, if they follow the pattern that they have in other places, there'll be some schools bombed and marketplaces bombed to destabilize the economy so it can't function, so the network and fabric of society will break down. They kill village leaders. I've read they articles kill about that. The Phoenix program being duplicated, killing village leaders, hauling people out and executing them to terror terrorize them from, from cooperating with the government. And their families. And, and their families. In fact, um, the last three weeks in these times has had some very good articles on Nicaragua that indicates that from Honduras, some hit squads were sent into Nicaragua that have killed at least 30 leaders and just innocent people in mm -hmm. that region and have terrorized peasants and people living in Nicaragua near the Honduras border because of these hit raids, although on the other hand, they've led these people to organize and become even more firm and resolute in their will to protect their country. So sometimes these destabilization programs backfire and end up stabilizing <laughs> the country well, unified. It, it them. certainly did in the Bay of Pigs. The CIA invasion there unified Cuba under Fidel Castro. He came out of that thing ten times, a hundred times stronger than he was going into it. And, uh, and that probably will be in effect in Nicaragua. They, these Nicaraguans dying will be added to the 800,000 I mentioned earlier, the, the victims, people who die as a direct as direct victims of CIA covert actions in the last 30 years, the minimum figure given by all responsible parties and press and government studies and whatnot is 800,000. The figures range from 800,000 to a couple of million victims of CIA operations. Right. Indirect type of... Indirect. And now, I, that does not include, for example, the people who died in the Vietnam War, which was a direct result of a CIA covert action. Or the, what, million and, and a half in Indonesia? The million and a half in, in Indonesia. Now, that's, that's a lot of dead people. Now, the circumstances of this killing are pure terrorism. Recruiting terrorists to go across the port border and blow up and assassinate and kill. We have to remember that. The next time President Reagan or Alexander uh, The Hague uh, are making their pious statements about the threat of international terrorism and the horrors of international terrorism, the United States is without any serious competition leading the world in international terrorism today and for the past 30 years. John, isn't there something unique about this Nicaraguan situation is that the administration is openly admitting that they are carrying it on? That's truly a difference. And uh, this gets back to the rogue elephant. Is the CIA a rogue elephant or is it, has it all these years been doing what the president wants? And, of course, the truth is both. In some cases, it's done what it wanted, contrary to presidential orders. In other cases, it's done what the president probably wanted but didn't say. In this case, because of the nature of the Secretary of State and the president, uh, the, the CIA is clearly doing exactly what the president wanted. Now, the, the president didn't hold a press conference to say, I'm sending in the CIA to kill people in Nicaragua, but... Uh, it, it has been admitted by the White House that they did, uh, uh, it's been leaked, and the president smiled at the leaks, that uh, he did order the CIA into this action. 
So he's clearly, you know, he's he sees himself as, uh, you know, Marshall Reagan, uh, uh, the sort of, you know, showing off how he can shoot. You know, let those yeah. people know he's got got something he can do. Lewis, while we're on Central America, we might also note that your group has published a book called White Paper, White Wash, in which you analyze the infamous white paper that was published by the American government to justify American intervention in El Salvador. Can you just briefly indicate some of the obvious whitewash in the white paper and some of the things published in your book, and then maybe we can tell our audience where they can get this? The white paper was published uh, in 1979 by, by uh, uh, well, I should say, I'm sorry, there were prior indications of, of propaganda about U.S. intervention uh, in El Salvador, but the, the original white paper that we're talking about here came out in 1981, February, February 1981, and it was uh, said to have been captured, there are a series of documents that were captured by uh, the Salvadoran Armed Forces. Now, we should remember, first of all, that uh, there were three accounts offered as to how the information was captured. One said it was found by a State Department intelligence man who went to, to El Salvador and saw it on a table in the headquarters of the Salvadoran Armed Forces. A second account said that uh, it was found in what was called a safe house of the guerrillas in San Salvador. And the third and most unlikely account was that it was uh, uh, captured from a guerrilla who was found walking through the streets of El Salvador with a whole packet of uh, documents under his arm. Uh, each of those accounts were offered as uh, the source of, of these documents. Uh, we have analyzed uh, the documents that's in, a, in, a, in this book, uh, co-edited co by uh, Warner Polchow, or edited by Warner Polchow with interviews with Philip Agee. And uh, it's very interesting to analyze, as has been done in the book, line by line, word by word, the, the so-called white paper. Um, there are parts of the paper, for example, that refer to, in English, uh, sections of the so-called Spanish, original Spanish language documents that don't exist. Uh, there are... Creative translation. Exactly. There are, there's one document, for example, that's partly in Spanish, in handwritten Spanish, and then uh, uh, on the same document it's typewritten in English. Mm. So we're asked to believe that whomever was sitting down at the table writing these shopping list for arms from Cuba, from Vietnam, from Ethiopia, uh, where and Libya uh, was going to move from a pen in, in Spanish to a typewriter and type in English, uh, and very, I might say, very literal, very literary English. Uh, there are a lot of contradictions in the white paper. Basically, we should understand this because it was and is the, the first and, and the most important justification that has been used by the government for its uh, intervention in El Salvador. Of course, now they pretend that uh, because the white paper was so widely discredited, um, even by one of its authors who, who gave an interview to the Wall Street Journal and disclosed that uh, uh, he even had a lot of questions about it. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of reason that this document or this exercise in propaganda is a classic in CIA uh, propaganda. So well, if, if the audience wants to order this uh, book, how can they get it? Well, they can uh, write to uh, the publisher, which is Deep Cover Publications. Uh, should I give the yeah, uh, sure. address in, in Post Office Box 677, New York, New York 10013, and it's, uh, uh, well... 650 plus a dollar fifty yeah, handling. Yeah. And can people also get the mailing list for your other publications? You've published a book called Dirty Work, the CIA in Western Europe, and another one called Dirty Work, the CIA in Africa, as well as putting out this Covert Action Information Bulletin. Will you give information on how they can order that, uh, those other they publications? Can write, they can write to us, to Covert Action Information Bulletin in Washington. I'll, I'll give the address, okay. uh, uh, Post Office Box 50272, 50272, Washington, D.C., 2004 and we'll be happy to send you the, the information. I find this very sad, by the way. I find I, it troubles me, uh, not uh, obviously because I was once part of all this, but also 
just as an American citizen, to realize that this country is indulging in activities that are just as cruel and just as, as depraved, in some cases, and almost as extensive as what, for example, the, the Gestapo indulged in in Germany. We haven't uh, liquidated uh, five million Jews, but uh, 800,000 minimum figure people killed in terrorist circumstances in the third world is a lot of people dead. And the responsibility, ultimately, yes, the, you know, it's done by the CIA and it's a secret organization, and therefore we have plausible denial to our own consciences because there's nothing we can do about it. We don't know about it. They didn't consult us. But the other side of that coin is that the CIA is the United States uh, police organ, and what it does, we, the American people, are responsible for. So that in addition to the personal losses of freedom of speech and freedom of the press, we are responsible for the genocide of terrorism that's taking place against the world today in our name and with our tax dollars. And with the changes of the laws and executive orders, the whole apparatus of the intelligence services, including the FBI and their right-wing hit squad buddies like the Nazis and the Klan, are now being able to be turned on the American people. Turned on the American with people. With impunity. Remember that, Lou Wolf mentioning the executive order, which we've all followed with great interest. That, too, is President Reagan going public, bragging about what he's doing with the CIA. But don't forget that the CIA has always functioned extensively inside the United States. The MH Chaos, you know, a billion-dollar program, was all domestic. The exper MK Ultra experimentation on, a, on American citizens with drugs and LSD and whatnot, uh, that went on for 20 years, and that was inside the United States on American guinea pigs. The opening of mail for 20 years was American citizens' mail. They've always done this thing. The Operation Mongoose war against uh, Cuba was run from, from Florida, and they had uh, over a thousand safe houses and boat docks and whatnot that they were operating from the United States. The training facilities uh, for uh, uh, torture, for interrogation techniques, were in San Antonio, Texas at one time. Uh, a few years back, and you know that's something that's easy to move somewhere else. I don't know where it is today. John, recently one of the individuals in the CIA that was in charge of these covert operations has recently resigned, and that is Admiral Bobby Inman, who was allegedly second in command at the CIA. It's been widely reported that Inman himself believed that William Casey, who is the director of the CIA, was overly fond of, quote, adventurous but ill-advised CIA operations aboard, abroad. And Senator Joseph Biden of Delaware has recently noted, without Inman, the intelligence agencies may be given license to try all kinds of questionable things here and abroad. In the light of what they've been doing, even under Inman already, what would be your comments on the Inman resignation in the future of the CIA? Well, I would have to regret the fact that he left, not that he was a paragon of liberal virtue, but he seemed to be, when compared with uh, William Casey and, and some of the others, Jesse Helms over on the Senate side, Carlucci, his predecessor, he seemed to have some pretty strong instincts for protecting American institutions. He protested the Names of Agents bill at one time, or at least one version of it, as being unessential to American national security, and of course he got a lot of criticism for that. Uh, it would seem that he was, in, in effect, a moderating influence on some of the crueler instincts of uh, men like Casey, who of course is a, a very inept and corrupt individual. The corruption being that he's maintained his own business portfolio, he's a millionaire, while he's CIA director, he's running the CIA, he's running his own businesses, and of course from the CIA he can have some influence on world <laughs> economic matters. He has also been appearing at Republican fundraisers, and of course that's one of the biggest no-nos in, uh, in, in uh, the United States governmental system, to have the head of a police organization with the influence of the CIA to openly advocate one political party's position and help it raise money. In that kind of a, of a corrupt, adventuresome 
atmosphere, one would have to regret Inman's resignation. Uh, the whole milieu, uh, the environment, is favorable to Reagan and the CIA and what they want to accomplish, what they are accomplishing. If you go one step further and consider uh, Reagan's policies his first year in office, he's muted this a little bit, faced with a clear indication by the American uh, p people, populace, about war. Uh, he and, and uh, Attila the Hague were <laughs> speaking <laughs> constantly about the viability of nuclear war, war was uh, an effective tool, we shouldn't be afraid of war, going to war in El Salvador, discussing sending troops into Nicaragua, talking frequently about going to the source quote in Cuba, and uh, talking about, you know, uh, demonstration wars or limited wars, nuclear wars in Europe and whatnot. These people gave every indication that they were looking for war. Now, they have toned this down a little bit in the last two months. First, you saw the turn, we all saw the turn, everybody who reads the newspapers, when the polls responded, 89% of the American people said they were, did not favor American uh, military intervention in Nicaragua. And uh, this was a pretty clear indication to the, the president that the American people were not going to support him. He would not be a successful president if he got us into a war. It would be uh, something that he would have trouble selling, trouble maintaining. At the same time, there was a move in Congress that uh, if the government of El Salvador didn't modify its human rights positions, they wouldn't get more money for aid. And then the second thing, of course, has been this massive groundswell reaction to his attitudes towards the bomb. And uh, that's national, every corner of the nation, little bitty towns across the nation organizing effectively and having big demonstrations, as well as the big, the big uh, cities. Uh, the nation and the world so deeply concerned about the threat of nuclear war and just absolutely horrified that you could possibly have a president in office whose mental capacities were so limited that he would actually talk publicly of demonstration atom bombs in Europe, popping off a bomb to show our will and resolve, limiting nuclear war to Europe, and the possibility of surviving nuclear war in the United States. This has horrified people to the point where he's got a big political problem on his hand from the famous ground zero and the freeze. And the result is that it's, it's forcing a change in their stated policies and attitudes. They're toning down quite a bit from what they were saying a year ago at this time, for example, responding to the mood of the nation in some frustration, I think, clearly. Well, thank you, John. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> We've exhausted you again, but we appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> now news stories from three different years. First, May of 1982. So we started our three-part investigation of CIA covert action with a program with John Stockwell and Lewis Wolf that talked about the Intelligence Identities Protection Act, and they did a criticism of it, of how it would subvert American civil liberties, freedom of speech, and our democracy. Well, since then, we found out in an article in The Progressive that Uncle Walter, Walter Cronkite, has joined John Stockwell and others in criticizing the Intelligence Identities Protection Act. The Progressive reports that Walter was talking in Dallas to the National Associations of Broadcasters Convention, and he attacked the Reagan administration's pattern of restriction on press freedom. He deplored administration support for Supreme Court rulings that permit police to raid newsrooms in search of sources and that compel journalists to disclose sources in court. He also lamented the administration decision to limit the Freedom of Information Act and the Reagan policy of no longer declassifying government documents automatically after 30 years. Walter scorned a plan to protect business information that would keep investigative stories and commentary on topics ranging from pollution threats to dangerous drugs at a serious disadvantage, and he called the free press's democracy the only fail-safe system against both the dangers of its own excesses and the approach of tyranny. While I'm citing stories from the progressive, I might also note that in the page after the story on Walter Cronkite, there's a story datelined Austin, Texas, with a headline, and that's the way 
It really is. The article begins, the ever-shriveling scope, the triumph of technique over content, and the cheerful rush to insipidity among anchors on network news are familiar aspects of television news. From the happy talk and video gimmicks of local newscasts to the corporate <coughs> paranoia of the networks, television's current events reporting has become almost dysfunctional. Viewers know this, hence the deep-seated distrust of the broadcast media. But the oligarchic nature of the television industry has blocked alternatives up until now, leaving most Americans reliant on the lighted box as their primary source of information. At last, the stranglehold may be broken, the article reads. And by whom? And by, by whom? whom? <laughs> For the past three years, we learned, a weekly news documentary program, Alternative Views, produced in Austin my, my and goodness. broadcast over the public access channel provided by the local cable franchise, has been doing what others do not. It has been presenting very unslick, intense, <laughs> hour-long documentaries and interviews with the likes of Ramsey Clark, Russell Means, Stokely Carmichael, Madeline Murray O'Hare, John Henry Falk, George Wald, John Henry Falk, Helen Caldicott, William Kunstler, Daniel Ellsberg, and John Stockwell. And then the article goes on to describe our program, the format, and what we're trying to accomplish. So we thank the Progressive for publishing this, and we'll pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> well, the mean on slick. Hey, really? I thought we were anybody. pretty slick here. <laughs> Trust us. <laughs> well, I'm, I would assume by now that you've heard about that famous remark by Thomas K. Jones, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Nuclear Theater. Uh, forces or strategic theater nuclear forces that's part of our own slickness there he says hey don't worry about nuclear war everybody's going to make it if you got enough dirt if there are enough shovels to go around you need those two things dig a hole cover it up with a couple of doors throw three feet of dirt on top and uh, you're safe from a nuclear holocaust folks well even to top that in that was just plain stupid but in uh, insensibility the department of energy study recommended that after a nuclear attack people over 40 years of age should be the first to leave their bomb shelters hell with that <laughs> <laughs> these post-tack pioneers would search for food and clean up a bit you know for the younger survivors because they say older people have a shorter life expectancy anyway and uh, the study reasoned that near lethal doses of radiation would make much difference anyway by the time they caught anything they'd already be dead and also, they wouldn't pass on any radiation-induced genetic defects to future generations. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they asked Grey Panther President Maggie Coon what she thought about that. <laughs> she told him. I'm right behind you, Frank. <laughs> yeah, well, 39. But something is being done about it. The city council in Cambridge, Massachusetts, determined that they, instead of having a cooperation day, for evacuation with the civil defense folks, they would have a preventive evacuation day by urging their citizens to join in the mass rally for disarmament in New York City on June the 12th. A lot of people are going to that. Do y'all like fairy tales? Well, there's a dandy one every week in Sunday's Parade magazine if you're into real fantasy. I'm talking, of course, about your basic free enterprise message from the ever-loving people of Mobile Oil part of their multi-million dollar a year PR package. I'm sure you've all seen this, it's called Observations, and they've always got this little cartoon in here that's never funny, if, in case you've all noticed before. <laughs> well, this whole thing is designed to show America once and for all, who are the good guys and who are the bad? A big is beautiful campaign, you might say. We're seeing a lot of this kind of thing on TV now, too. The whitewater canoeist experiencing the thrill of victory, while simultaneously clearing the good name of Getty Oil. Those cute little oil wells are swarm with 59 different endangered species of birds and bugs. The industrious cartoon pie, pie maker who has the world beating a path to his door to bid on his pies. They all strain to make that one meaningful statement. Hell, we just plain old folk like you. Well, is anybody listening? Personally, I'm underwhelmed at their sincerity and a tad put off by the political motif of stuff like this. You think Reagan's a supply cider? This column makes him sound like Karl Marx or Freddie Engels. This particular one was exemplary. 
It made a, a monumental leap of reasoning across two centuries to assert that George Washington's troops almost starved to death at Valley Forge because of price controls. We'll all be. I didn't know that. <laughs> After a quick razzle-dazzle with oil production figures and constant 1980 dollars, the text then leads you to the inescapable conclusion that it would be silly to put price controls on natural gas. I mean, we wouldn't want the troops to starve. All those poor old oil barons down gutting it out in the trenches with the dirt, the vermin, the spilled Perrier. <laughs> I may just be paranoid, but whenever corporations start billing their programs and ideas as a boon to all mankind, I think it's time to hide the silverware. And I still can't help but feel a little bit guilty when we fund the torture of peasants so that United Fruit can bring the world to us packed in a light syrup. From May of 1982, we now switch to May of 1983. According to the Wall Street Journal, Mr. Reagan's energy department has been busily doling out more of that welfare for the rich. Rich oil companies in this case. The General Accounting Office, which is a congressional watchdog agency, says that the department is making settlements with oil moguls that are unduly favorable to the industry. So what's new? The GAO charges that the Reagan team is letting some of the major oil companies off the hook to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. Shell Oil, U.S. Steel's Marathon Oil, Mobile Oil Company, and several others were nailed for overcharging customers prior to the decontrol of oil in 1981. You may have seen the 60 Minutes segment that dealt with how new oil miraculously became old oil with its higher price tag and all that rot. Well, now comes payback time, and suddenly the Reagan gang is getting generous again with our money. The administration's top official in the department, Rayburn Hanslick, says the new settlements are based on, quote, more accurate and more realistic cost figures than they ever had before. I guess somebody boogered up a neater set of books for the department this time. Shell Oil, for one, will save a pretty penny because of this. Company officials had originally bargained with the Carter administration to settle an alleged $151 million in overcharges. The Carter people said, ante up 75 million, we'll call it square. Well, now Mr. Reagan's department says that 50 million is quite enough, thank you. Marathon Oil overcharged customers some $41 million, according to government investigators. Mr. Hanslick and the boys in the back room will settle for $11 million. The topper is a deal they cut with Mobile. Overall, Mobile may have ripped off buyers for more than $900 million, $900 million in various cost violations. Our benevolent energy department says $29 million will cover it. Or cover it up might be a better way to put it. <laughs> Well, because of the hubbub surrounding these sweet deals, the department has delayed signing some of the agreements and others pending with Gulf Oil and Cities Service, which was just recently swallowed up by Occidental Petroleum. The Wall Street noted also that the Reagan team has not shown any great enthusiasm at all for pursuing this type of enforcement. In fact, the administration budget for 1984 proposed cutting their allotment from $21 million down to $7 million. They don't want them nosing around too much but why would they want to bite the hand that feeds them? For my own part, I'm not particularly surprised by this whole affair. Once a week, it seems, the business press carries something or other like this. It's blatant stuff, and it's pretty old hat. What really amazes me is that so much energy is devoted to railing against pissant things, such as unreported busboy and waitress tips, Social Security overpayments, where Gramps has gotten a part-time job selling candles, and food stamp abuse. These damn people are eating. <laughs> and all the while, it's business as usual in the counting house. You know, I've just about decided to become a finance baron so I can live outside of the law, too. Say, Craig, I found an old uh, statistic which I uh, used about a few years ago, but it bears on what you were saying a while ago. When the price of gasoline at the pump is raised one penny around the country, do you know how much wealth goes from us to them? Yeah, any it's got to be astounding. More than five dollars. It's two 
$1.9 million a day. A day. Mm, a day. In so, pennies. So you can imagine how much is going back to the oil companies after the oil glut brought the price down and then the uh, government uh, Put on that what five cents? Five, to, five cents a gallon. Five cents, but they raised it much higher yeah, it than seems, five seems cents. Yeah, it seems to go up about, yeah, about 10 seventeen cents. Anywhere between ten and seventeen cents, they raise it above that. So you can figure out that additional above the tax, and uh, figure out from two point nine million a day. Take that over a year. I'm no good at math, but that's, that's a lot of money. A lot of money. In May of 1983, the Congress went along with Reagan's crazed plan to produced the MX missile, and it looks like money is being freed to continue the MX missile program, even though it appeared that it was going to be defeated. However, there's an article in, in these times that indicates it's going to be a little bit difficult to base these MX missiles anywhere in the country because of the pro public opposition to the missile, the grassroots opposition that's arising. When Carter was talking about his racetrack concept to have the MX missiles on this racetrack that would be put in Nevada or Utah, the citizens of that state organized and put tremendous pressure on the governor, the state legislature, to try to make it not be the case that these missiles be put in, in Nevada and Utah so that suddenly this program was abandoned by the federal government. Then they started talking about Montana and Wyoming as a good place to put the dense pack MX missiles. Well, there was a lot of opposition that has already arisen in Montana. The governor came out against it and eight of the nine congressional representatives as well as grassroots groups throughout Montana. However, Wyoming, the governor and some of the Congress people there seems to be a little friendlier to the MX and they have invited the Air Force to come and check out the state and said they would cooperate with them as an MX missile site. However, a grassroots opposition group in Wyoming is now starting to form called Western Solidarity. Some of the same people that organized opposition to the MX in these other states are going to Wyoming to help them organize. They're planning a big rally in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and more and more groups and individuals are becoming aware of the dangers to their ecology and, of course, to their very survival if there was ever a nuclear war. So grassroots opposition to the MX missile program is growing significantly in Wyoming itself. Therefore, if the Reagan administration attempts to try to base these MX missiles anywhere in the southwest or the northwest, they're going to get grassroots opposition from a new group called Western Solidarity that's organized throughout this region, consisting of ranchers, of church groups, of environmentalists, of public citizens, all of whom are opposed to the MX missile, including now a group in Wyoming. We've had stories from 1982 and 83, and now May 1985. Probably Ronald Reagan's greatest political and public relations blunder was his visit to Bitburg, Germany, to the cemetery where SS troopers were buried, along with other German and American soldiers. You also might wonder why Reagan originally didn't agree to go to a concentration camp and to a commemoration service for the dead Jews who were killed in the Holocaust. Well, the New York Times reported that Nancy Reagan put a zap on that, that she thought that Holocaust and concentration camps were sort of a downer and too depressing, and she thought that Reagan should project a more positive, happy, cheerful image, so she vetoed a trip to a concentration camp. However, there was such an outcry when it was revealed that there were all these SS stormtroopers buried at Bitburg that Reagan did finally agree to go to a concentration camp. Well, the Village Voice, the week before Reagan's visit to Germany, had an article about anti-Semitism in the Reagan administration and some very dubious attitudes of some of his officials in an article called Bitburg, Tip of the Iceberg. Reagan's communications director is Pat Buchanan, who you may have seen on the cable news network on the Firing Line show. And Buchanan, I think, was also a Spiro Agnew speechwriter and very active in the Nixon administration. Craig, you've read about Buchanan's attitude towards anti-Semitism and the Jews. That's right. There is an office in, uh, that Congress had a hand in setting up uh, under the aegis of the Justice Department. It's called the Office of Special Investigations. 
and which supposedly is, was set up to prosecute and deport alleged Nazi war criminal, criminals and collaborators who fraudulently entered the United States. Well, Mr. Buchanan, since he became involved with it, it has not been uh, too gung-ho about uh, prosecuting these people. In fact, he said in, in a speech, he said he saw nothing singular about the Holocaust. He said, and in, in it, quote, just seems to me that allocating funds into running down aggressively these people is just not a proper use of resources. And like you say, he was, he was involved with the, the Nixon campaign. He was a speechwriter for Mr. Nixon. And uh, if you'll recall, if you read the, the Watergate tapes, the book uh, uh, that was made uh, from the tapes, there were several anti-Semitic slurs on the tape from Mr. Buchanan. And it's said that uh, Mr. Buchanan was the one uh, important White House staffer who convinced Mr. Reagan to, to go ahead and visit Bitburg. The Reagan administration, in fact, Ronald Reagan himself, this time is also in trouble for writing a friendly letter to one of the most notorious anti-Semitics in the whole United States, a Dr. Roger Pearson, who's the president of the Council for Social and Economic Studies. Reagan wrote him a letter congratulating him on his journal and saying that you are performing a valuable service in bringing to a wide audience the work of leading scholars who are supportive of a free enterprise economy, a firm and consistent foreign policy, and a strong national defense. However, Mr. Pearson has also been active in anti-Semitic circles for many decades. In Britain, in 1956, he started publishing a racist journal called Northern World, whose purpose was to make whites aware of their forgotten racial heritage and to cut through the Judaic fog of lies about our origin and the accomplishment of our race and Western culture. In 1958, Mr. Pearson founded a Northern League in uh, Britain whose purpose was to bring together the strands of post-war neo-Nazism and whose members included racial theorists who were active in the Nazi regime in Germany. Then he came to the United States in 1964 and began publishing a journal called Western De uh, Destiny, who had on its editorial board what the Village Voice described as a rogues gallery of racist and anti-Semites, Klan leaders, Holocaust debunkers, former Waffen SS officers, British and American neo-Nazis and fascists, members of the White Citizens Council, etc. They then started publishing a journal called Mankind Quarterly that specialized in racist articles, including one that reported on a 1962 trip to South Africa that was sponsored by the apartheid government to study, quote, Bantu racial characteristics that was illustrated by a photo of a Zulu man in profile intended to illustrate his Jewish nose. Since then, Mr. Pearson has published a whole stream of racist and anti-Semitic books, Eugenics and Race, Blood Groups and Race. He received $36,000 from the Pioneer Fund that was dedicated to scientific racism and run by political associates of Senator Jesse Helms, and more recently has been involved with the Liberty Lobby uh, anti-Semitics and racists in publishing several uh, anti-Semitic things. So this is a gentleman that Ronald Reagan sent a personal letter to congratulating him on the valuable service that his public publishing enterprises are carrying forth. And even after the criticism was leveled against Mr. Pearson for being one of the most grotesque racists in his country, the Reagan administration refused to retract the praise in this letter and refused to criticize Mr. Pearson publicly, showing an incredible moral blindness on the part of the Reagan administration towards uh, the issue of anti-Semitism. It's nothing new there. And that's Alternative Views for this evening. We hope you enjoyed our three-part series on covert action around the world. If you have any comments to make, here's our address, Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78712. Good night.